Folks, I'm very excited for my guest today. He's created a lot of acclaimed comics, things from Hip Hop Family Tree to X-Men Grand Design. We're gonna talk about his new project today. He's also a YouTuber that talks about comics like pretty much every day. Folks, please welcome Ed Piscor. Ed, nice to see you. Chris, thanks for having us, man. Uh, you you uh, supplied us with our very first super chat uh, by way of uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe's YouTube channel, man. And I gotta thank you for that. I actually didn't even know that that was a thing or that it existed. I didn't realize that I was the first, but um, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. I. I I think I came across your channel uh, pretty early on, and I've been promoting it to everyone that I can uh, uh, talk to. I think that you, you guys create, you and Jim Rugg create a fantastic uh, show. I do want to talk about that, but I, I'd like to start talking about your current comic project, especially because we're all seeing you here on the screen, and it looks like you're at a comic convention. You've got like you know the full promo uh, <laughs> ready to go. I was I was thinking of even uh, putting a drape behind me, like yeah. uh, the way Jim and I used to do our stuff, man, to to really give it that Comic Con vibe. I, or if you, you want to go with you know the wrestling, your your cartoonist kayfabe, maybe some fireworks behind you when when I introduced you, that that would have worked too. <laughs> but Red Room is your current project. Um, I think that it's actually pretty different than a lot of the other things that you've done. Um, although now that I think of it, like each of your projects really has had a very different flavor to it, whether you go talking about real life, whether you're doing something sort of like recapping mainstream. Red Room, what I'd love to know from you, why you decided to do the model the way you're doing, which is interesting because you do um, the pages to your Patreon supporters. You, you, you give that to them as regular content. So it's in a sense, a little bit crowdfunded comics. And now you've got the print edition coming out from Fantagraphics. There's obviously a lot of different ways to, to put comics out there into the world. What made you decide to do it this way? Uh, I was just kind of playing around, to be honest. Uh, I, I definitely believe in uh, just giving the comics away uh, if, if there's a vector to do so. So when I was doing WYSIWYG, I, I gave all the pages away. Uh, for, for free when I was doing Hip Hop Family Tree. I serialized it on this, this website called Boing Boing for uh, four and a half years. And uh, right now, the, the way Red Room is kind of formatted, a lot of weird shaped panels, things like this, uh, can't really serialize it too easy on Instagram. And I don't have a real website that I support or anything. So I figured, you know, I'll put this Patreon together just for the heck of it, uh, you know, be a follower for once and, and uh, do what the rest of the crowd is doing. Uh, I still want to put it out in a uh, completely free way also. Um, Webtoon won't have me. Uh, it's a little bit too, too uh, aggressive uh, sort of content for their platform. So I got to figure that part out because I do want these pages to, to fly. Uh, my philosophy has always kind of been like, if you can't give it away, man, nobody's going to pay a dollar for your comic. Uh, so so that's that's the thought. Um, but also, uh, I'm kind of playing with the house's money a little bit. Um, the hip hop books are doing well. The X-Men books are doing well. WYSIWYG still brings me a check every every uh, quarter. So it's like, let me let me make a weird one. Let me make one that I know is going to have a niche audience of, you know, maniacal, crazy fans who are down with this kind of splatter movie hardcore trauma flick kind of energy because that's that's some energy that i come from as well you know like i like those um 80s 90s comics like the earliest of caliber press you know yes. Crow, vince Locke, uh gary reed uh guy davis troy nixie tim vigil james obar like i come from that pedigree you know i love that stuff Mm -hmm. so, so I feel it. I do. I, I it's and just to like sort of give a small recap in case people don't know, Red Room is very much. It's it's about torture on the dark web, right? I mean, is that a, a fair uh, assessment? I mean, maybe I'm simplifying it too much, but I mean that that that's at the heart of it, right? It's it's pretty yeah. extreme. There's this there's this uh this urban legend that's been floating around for basically for the tenure of the dark web and ideas of like snuff have been around even before that. Um, but the dark web is an interesting playground uh, to to kind of warehouse this idea because 
the comment, like the sort of reason for the dark web's existence is to kind of escape impun, like in litigation, you know, it's, you're supposed to not be, it's very trained. anonymous. Yeah. Uh, so with that kind of wild west um, form of the internet, a place where like when you hear people getting busted, they're getting busted for having sending people Uzis that are, you know, in five pieces, like stuck inside of an Xbox. Uh, people are doing crazy stuff on there. And this idea of Red Rooms has, has, has been around for as long as the dark web. So um, thinking about, you know, the, like those kind of cam girl websites, like what, like what if Red Room is like the murder version of that, you yes. man, where you got some patrons who are, you know, pledging Bitcoin, which is uh, untraceable in a traditional paper trail kind of way, pledging their Bitcoin to have these like kind of dark requests processed or something. Uh, it's very visual, you yes. know, uh, you want to remain anonymous. So it behooves you to have uh, some kind of disguise. So I get to draw a bunch of cool costumes. Um, you know, I'm just have, having fun. Uh, comics have, has, uh, what was the, the book that, that Gary and, and Eric and Kim Thompson put out uh, the the oral history of Fantagraphics. Um, we told you so, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, you know, comics as art, something like that. Uh, you know, the, comics has made its point. Uh, it's in academic circles. Things are hanging on walls in galleries and museums. You know, let's let's get hardcore again. Why why okay. not? Okay, that's fair. One thing um, that, that's interesting, uh, you, you were kind enough to share a bunch of the pages so I could sort of get caught up on. It seems like you're using a lot more physical media techniques um, that I ne haven't necessarily seen you use in some of your previous books. Um, you know, uh, splatter from maybe a toothbrush or something like that I'm seeing. I'm seeing you like use a lot of different types of, of pens and tools. Is that a part of the goal with the uh, Red Room to sort of experiment and push yourself with tools or, or am I just sort of reading into that? Experimenting with everything. Uh, you said it earlier, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's a monthly comic. Uh, every story self-contained. So ultimately, um, at the very bare minimum, there's going to be 13 issues. Right. And I'm trying to do some different stuff with every single issue. Uh, even when the free comic book day comic comes out, there's going to be like a color uh, strip in there. Um, I'm okay. going to play with some spot color, but you're hundred percent right. Uh, I'm messing around with a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, some strips are drawn on much smaller paper. Some strips are going to be drawn on bigger paper. I, I might brush ink one or two in order to get the tones for a story or two. I might use uh, just, just pencil and then take that into Photoshop and color half tone it so that it looks like photo statted. Mm. Uh, this is, and, and, so that's the art part of it. The writing part of it, man, I might do like a first person issue. I might, uh, I'm certainly playing with all different um, points of view when, after introducing this problem to the universe, you know, like, so some certain strips are gonna focus on the people who are the enactors, the patrons of this stuff, perhaps okay. the victims. Uh, it's, it's a world building exercise. Yeah, I, I just, um... It's an interesting story. It's the art really caught my eye. It, it's 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 raw in a good way. I mean, like the, the the art is refined. It's just that like using those techniques, like the duo tone and the uh, or duo shade and the and the and the splatter effects and stuff. It really caught my eye. It just feels very organic and and raw, and I, and I like that. Um, let me um let me let me switch gears a little though. Um, one thing that's always interested me is you have a, a, um, your, your background in, in, in getting taught, you know, part of that was you did go to the Kubert school for, I believe, like one year, is it? Or yes, sir. Yeah. Not a lot of us out there, even comic fans, necessarily know exactly what that entails, going to like, you know, an art school to learn comics. Like, what was that like? What can you tell us about what that's like? And, and, and did you feel that it helped prepare you? It was uh, certainly my my early goal was was to go there, and I was kind of building my life around that in middle school and high school. Uh, I recognized that my ability was not, 
you know, I wasn't a young Joe Matarera who was going to be drawing a Marvel Comics present story at age 16. Like that, that just wasn't going to happen. I needed some instruction. And I thought that I could at least get to a place where my portfolio would be considered, uh, you know, in, to, to, to go be a student at the Joe Kubert School, because I kind of believed the kayfabe that, that they kind of put out there, that it's, you know, it's a very elite school. You got to maintain your studies. If you, if you screw up an assignment, uh, you, you get kicked out. Uh, you know, when I went there, that, that just wasn't the case. And I think that that's probably the deal with like most uh, colleges and stuff. Yeah. I was going to say art schools. Cause I like, I don't know about university. I but... would extend it to most colleges and art schools. Like you have to be an exceptionally bad student for them to not take your money once you're in. Yeah. And you know what? That's, that's exactly the deal, man. That's exactly the deal. So uh, it actually, it felt kind of insulting because I, I tried so hard uh, to, to get there. And yeah. uh, a, a lot of kind of goofballs were, 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 t were taking up space. And I was thinking like, you know, I bet like every, every kid that got drafted to, to, to play, you know, college ball, like at least knows how to play basketball. It's like, you know, some of these dudes are, are nuts. All that said, man, uh, you know, education, it, it's, it, it's on the student, not the teacher, right? So I, no, I no. maximized every second of my time out there. Uh, my, my, my folks, you know, they're steel mill working people, man. This is like Pittsburgh is very salt of the earth, pragmatic. So mm -hmm. uh, what I needed that year for was to have an, a, a, a total excuse to be able to just draw constantly for like a, a year. Right. Uh, you know, right. like the folks are very pragmatic people, G go get a job, like that sort of stuff. It, it, my pops was even suggesting like, you know, you could join the military, son, like that, like that types of shit. And uh, this comic thing has always been important to me. I was always kind of moving in this direction. Uh, so I needed that year really for that. And I'm also a very visual learner. So when I saw you know, Doug Barron, my, my methods and materials teacher, bust out that, that Raphael 8404 and slide that on a piece of paper, man, after, after uh, you know, rolling the brush and getting that real sharp, thick tip on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I only need to see that one or two times and, okay. and I'm good to go. Do, did it give you um, some discipline? It, it gave you the time you're talking about, the time to sit down. Did, did it help at all with any sort of like discipline of like, you've got to crank out art or was that already in you, do you think? I definitely, because, because of the pragmatism of Pittsburgh, uh, I knew that there's, there's not much out there for me. Uh, it's like, you better make it work in comics if that's what you really want, because yeah, to make my money to go to school, I was sheet rocking bathrooms and hanging drywall with my uncle, you know what really? I'm saying? So, so it's like, it's either that or this, this is much cooler. Uh, easy motivator to sit down at the drawing board and churn out some pages. Uh, but the, the big benefit for me really was uh, just learning visually, man, and, and buying me the time to, uh, to, to, to do the work, you know, like yeah. I went there, like you said, for that one year, um, I think it cost maybe like 18, $20,000 all told with the, with the housing and stuff, which wow. in 2000, that was, might as well have been 20 grand, like, like it might as well have been 200 grand or something to me, man. It took me two years to, uh, wow. to, to pay that off. And uh, so when I got home, I started, you know, continuing through inertia, I kept drawing, drawing, drawing. But then that first student loan check came and I'm like, oh shit, I, I just began my life in the red, man. Like, I don't like this feeling. So I uh, worked my butt off for a couple of years and uh, I got a call from my homies who were at the, the art school when they were in their senior year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was almost like a, like a, uh, what do you call it, man? Um, one of those calls were uh, a speakerphone call where there's like five dudes on it. Sure. And I'm like, man, these guys are having so much fun. And it, it made me mad, but also like, oh, I got to get you guys. Like, like uh, you guys are still in school. Like I have to get in the game. I have to quit working at this stupid call center and do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, they, they don't know it, but that was like a big motivator, man, just to get mm. that call from these dudes telling me how cool it is to have classes from, from Joe himself. 
And uh, within just a couple of months after that, I got my first call from Harvey Picar. You know, started making strips, sending them out. Yeah. And uh, Harv, Harv gave me a call, man, and that that uh, that set me off. You know, I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, your first work. Uh, I mean, what a, what an amazing like platform. Like, was that your first paid work for Harvey, or was some, did you do anything before that that was paid? Uh, the the first um, paid paid piece I did was. Uh, it was um, illustration work for for Hustler magazine, but I was uh, I was underage, and uh, he was like, I didn't know you were seventeen, and I was like, Well, you didn't ask, man. Um, <laughs> there were there were these books called the Artist Market. Um, okay. These these like big phone book sized books that you could get at Barnes and Noble. They come out every year, and it would just be a list of art directors and shit. And mm. uh, every week, I would send fifty, sixty envelopes to these different places but they really pad out that 500 pages yeah. so uh like say big brother magazine is a skateboard magazine that um that is it was under larry flint's uh huh. enterprise okay so I was sending stuff to big brother and shit and uh the art director from hustler hit me up and he's like you know what man there's no money in in doing illustrations for big brother uh porn is where it's at and and hustler pays better than everybody uh, and you don't want to do cartoons. You want to do this double page spread thing. And at the time, there was this art directed dude who he was hiring Dan Klaus and Coop and Jaime Hernandez. Like it, he was. Wow. Uh, That's good company being. He, he became the art director of uh, Arthur Magazine, which was this really cool uh, free free paper that would come out like once a month, every every now and then, a um, couple years back. Anyhow, like that was the first time that I had an opportunity. But that that went away super quick, and then uh, Harv is the first comic comic stuff, and okay, I looked up to that guy in a big way, man. Oh, he, I, I'm a huge huge fan of of Harvey. Just like it's so real and it's funny because it's real, not like a setup punchline type thing. So much as we're just getting slice of life stuff that's so relatable. Um, huge fan of Harvey Picard, and I remember very clearly like meeting him at at least one SPX, the small press expo. Oh yeah, I was there, dude. Like uh you, you walked That's what I was wondering about. Where did probably. you go with him? Yeah, yeah. Like uh the the SPX uh the 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 cover for the catalog was yeah. drawn by by Josh Newfield. Yes. And he, he draws Harvey and then there were like bobbleheads because if you remember when the American Splendor flick came out, there's a Harvey P car bobblehead toy okay and, and uh josh drew bobbleheads of of me dean haspel and himself like on the table with with harvey like that was the first time i did a panel uh was at that spx uh it was it was it was very cool there's a there's a chance like i i don't remember for sure but there's a, absolutely a chance we could have like talked there because i definitely when i i would go to spx every year i lived in dc Oh, cool. And I made a point of, of going to like almost every table and really like talking to the creators. The thing I love about either small press conventions or Artist Alley is the passion on display. Um, no matter what, people are like doing things kind of like you are with something like Red Room or your other comics where they're, the first concern isn't like how big a paycheck am I getting or am, is this going to get me in front of like Marvel or DC? It's I have a story that I just have to get out of my head. Um, and I was just kind of curious uh, what your thoughts on um, conventions are. Do you enjoy the promotion aspect going to conventions or do you, do you find that it's a slog like, or, or do you have some conventions that you like and others that are like more like work? I'm curious about your thoughts on conventions. Man, it's sort of all of the above. Uh, I definitely have my favorites. Uh, Heroes Con in North Carolina in particular is probably like one of my favorite uh, festivals to, to visit because uh, built a nice audience there, but also the the sort of blend of cool independent uh, cartoonists who are who are there and uh, more mainstream cartoonists that are there really awesome yeah. also devoted to comics so you know the budget for the show um, isn't going to getting Lou Ferrigno to show up or or any of that he you know, shows Aaron, up no matter what <laughs> Aaron Gray is not getting uh, you know half the budget and and half the uh ballroom space for catering oh. um, spx is is a unique one that that i really dig because uh like you said the people are there they're they're makers and yeah. uh they they care about just making a cool comic and over the years uh getting to know people there are people who 
take maybe an hour to to uh bind together books sometimes man like big trade paperbacks with special silk screen covers all this and uh it's like are you sure this is really just ten dollars <laughs> yeah you know like i've uh, sat down with some of those people just they're, they're like look they're just like look i just need all my friends to help me like you know they've got the long arm stapler and you're just doing it really self-printed almost not not self-published it's 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 cool though yeah yeah no i love it man like the, the energy at spx is 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 freaking awesome man uh but uh to to be honest like i didn't get into the game to to do that uh i like my fantasies were always exactly you know what what i'm going to do when the, the the camera's off man you flip the flip the chair around and get to grind it man hmm. uh making comics the process is everything to me uh i will do all the other stuff in order to bolster the opportunity to do that okay, so i'll okay. promote i'll promote my comics you know the the youtube channel was a was a good idea because it yeah. certainly uh created an audience that didn't necessarily know uh my work beforehand and they're showing up in a big way we just got a look at some, peek at some numbers uh and was very astonished man uh part, part of doing the youtube channel was in service of red room in a way because it's like you know i did my hacker computer hacker comic and there's an audience for that like i was mm -hmm. able to get coverage in wired magazine when it was just self-published and stuff mm -hmm. hip-hop obviously audience for that x-men fans come built in uh now i got this comic this idea that i want to do or ears are getting chopped off and people are getting disemboweled Pretty there is strange. an audience for that uh there is an audience for that uh but i got a work a little extra to um you know acquaint myself with them in a way yeah and you've really built yourself um a loyal audience by having that youtube channel and having that consistency so that even if that like story wasn't necessarily the first story that a lot of those people would go out and read they're curious what you're doing because they they, they start to feel like a, a connection with you it's, it's it's very smart i think it's 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 really a, a cool thing it was it started as a project to just kind of go through these wizard magazines and i thought it would be a fun thing but it's just yeah. it's just grown and grown man I, really when, when we first connected i think you had maybe uh maybe like you know 30k subscribers and your sh your shit just blew the hell up and uh it's it's cool to see how this stuff works and it, it's also interesting to yeah. see what people gravitate toward and it's also interesting to see the relationship that people have with it compared to the way Jim and I think about it, because it's just me and my homeboy hanging out for a couple of hours, like talking comics. And then like the comments and the feedback that come in, it's like, oh, these people take us seriously. Like, uh, <laughs> like, they, like yeah. they're really listening to us and, and um, yeah. sort of taking what we say for gospel sometimes. It, it, like when we'll put out a video and be like, is this the first graphic novel? And it's Starenko's Chandler, like it's not the first graphic novel, uh, but but it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. like there's a continuum that got to like what we know of as the graphic novel. But I know what you mean, like you you sort of. It's not that you're saying I'm an authority and this is what, the fact about comics, but you're the one with the microphone, so people <laughs> like trust you, you know, I'd love to talk a little more about the channel, but let me back up slightly. Um, how did you and Jim Rugg like uh, meet in the first place? Because obviously you're a duo on that show. Like, how did you meet Jim? Yeah, he he never uh, says the story right, man. Uh, so like, I I remember it very very clearly because I was I was the enactor. I was the the catalyst for the whole deal. So when I when I uh, connected with him at the beginning, it was because of Harvey P. Carr. Like, I hooked up with Harv, started working on those comics, and. Uh, it was early enough, like 2001, 2002, it was still early enough where you could buy every kind of independent comic that would come through your comic shops. And I'm talking about real independent comic, not not image comics, but like yeah, oddball. More the top shelf or Fantagraphics or something, maybe? Definitely all that stuff. Like yeah. those would be rare morsels, man. Maybe one or two things a quarter would come out from, from those companies. And uh, Zurich books, essentially, yeah. you know, self-published things. And uh, I got the first Street Angel self-published joint and and uh, kind of just sat on it for a minute. But then I 
you know, was just reading one night and I'm like, oh, this, this is a Pittsburgh guy. And what I was really impressed by, because, you know, there's, I won't say what I was about to say, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, he, you know, he, his work was, was sharp, you know, and it, and it was local. And I'm like, well, it makes sense that the local comic dudes know each other at least, you know? So, so I, okay. I reached out uh, through his website and I actually wasn't even sure if I was connecting with the right people. And if you, if you ever see the first reading, you, you, like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm just like hitting up all these, the, the people who are on that website and eventually got everything straight. So we connected at the Pittsburgh Comic-Con that year and then set up an idea to like meet on new comic day, Wednesdays, uh, you know, at the comic shop, go get our fresh comics, go down to the coffee shop, yeah. BS for an hour. And, uh, and that's how it started. The very, very first time we connected and went to the comic shop, did all that. He was working on, I think maybe Street Angel issue two came out. And he was talking about what um, ended up becoming aphrodisiac. Uh, there was another dude there who was talking about uh, the comic that he kind of was dreaming up, and then and then it it came out like Antarctic or Antarctic Press joint. Yep. And then my thing was like the straggler behind man. Uh, I it, like I was telling them about my idea for WYSIWYG, but I was connected with Harvey, so I had you know three hundred pages of Harvey comics to do. Uh, Harvey Picard comics, not Richie Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all got that, but the, thank you for the clarification. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, no you know, it just, stuff. <laughs> it just became this uh, habitual thing for us, man. Uh, the crazy. way I just described it, though, it was like, it was less um, kind of like shop talk in some ways. And it was more like a dope addict gallery shooting gallery or something because like we'd just be bringing pages and everybody wanted to wanted to sort of be able to exist in that space so everybody's bringing pages and everybody's working on pages tom shioli shows up later and that guy he's got a nine to five job and is like inking on the bus uh, on the way to to the shop always bringing wow. pages. he was on godland and that was like a monthly comic so he's always bringing tons of pages it was it was really cool those dudes are um at least five years older than me i think tom's even older so <laughs> at that age like 21 that's to me i feel like i was still in the formative stage like if i wouldn't have connected with jim at at, the, at that time i was really uh edging to be you know a job dude I, like i would have drawn you know penciled spider-man or something like that well it's kind of interesting that you say that because now, of course, you and Jim and Tom and some other guys are uh, doing a little bit more of a mainstream uh, collaboration. It's 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 not huge uh, uh, output each, but uh, inking Rob Liefeld snake eyes, that blew my mind. It's obviously not the energy any of you guys necessarily give out. Although if you watch Cartoonist Kayfabe, it's obvious that you have a lot of respect for all the image founders. It's it's really obvious. But how did that come about? Did he just approach you or something because he he knows about the show or or what? Yeah, I mean he's sm Rob is a smart marketer, man. And how do you how do you goose the numbers on an issue five these days? Uh, do some kind of stunt casting. So mm -hmm. so it makes total sense. Like I I don't I don't think I've seen that approach before. So it's, it's like a fresh spin. I'm certainly super curious to see that issue. Let me see what a Neil Adams rob liefeld collaboration two-page spread looks like i, I want to see that yeah I, I i agree i you know i was uh i bought the first couple issues out of like just curiosity rob, rob can always inspire curiosity i didn't know if i would finish it i wasn't really super into it but then like all these uh classic artists and like new artists are gonna work on it i'm like i i don't know what this is gonna be i've got to see it i've got to see it I, I bet a lot of people will feel like that. I could definitely see Snake Eyes 5 outselling 4 and 3. Oh, totally. I, I think it's genius. Like the, the, the object of that is a perfect piece of kind of cartoonist kayfabe fodder. That, that's the kind of thing that we would show off, kind of like a Heroes for Hope uh, or Heroes for Hunger kind of yeah. weird thing with new people on every page. But uh, the, the, the channel, cartoonist kayfabe is a little bit of a mirror of where we come from and of our 
you know, sort of tastes uh, across across the board in a way, you know, from from our kind of youthful formative stage to to like more modern time. So I think about like I've I've done three collaborations in comics: uh, Harvey P. Carr, yep. Jay Lynch, who was like a underground pioneer, designed a lot of garbage pail kid cards. Yep. had a had a strip called Nard and Pat, which was great. And Rob Liefeld, you know, so like that's those are that's a cartoonist cafe pedigree right there. It is, it is, yeah. Like very, very different uh, going from indie to as mainstream as you basically can get. Um, what was it like? Do, have you done that already, or is it still to be done? Oh no, we've we've done it. Uh, J- Jim did his as well, and we we have videos that we did on the, on the channel uh, showing the process. Uh, I'm sorry of- that I didn't realize that. That's something I can't wait to watch now. Uh, it's, it's, it was super fun. And I, like, you know, like I got my page, you know, month and a half ago or something. And I'm just trying to figure out like, how do you make this interesting? So, you know, sped it up and look for some good uh, creative commons music so that the video doesn't get, you know, taken down by YouTube or whatever. Yeah. Then, then comes Jim's uh, page. And when I couldn't wait to see, you know, we were all giddy about it. Yeah, and and showing each other the pencils, like, oh, dude, I can't wait to do this. I'm going to do that. So I saw his pencil uh, page, and there's a very cool dog pile image and stuff. A bunch of soldiers messing up uh, snake eyes, but you know he gets one over. And then when I saw Jim's video, I was crying, laughing uh, the whole time because it was uh, he did the same speed up gimmick, but he was playing it to like Mozart music. <laughs> <laughs> Blast it up. The uh, the juxtaposition was beautiful. That's really interesting. Well, congratulations. I mean, because it just sounds like a very unique little project. I hope that that helps also get you some further attention for your books. Um, yeah, I was, I was actually about to ask whether you've done much collaboration. I, 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 everything I've read of yours looks like, you know, you do almost everything. Um, on X-Men, you even did like the color separation, right? X-Men Grand Design? Yeah, sure. I was curious, on Red Room, I didn't really look closely. Are you doing the lettering as well? Yeah, all by hand. Uh, like that's, that's what I thought, I, but I wasn't sure. That was probably the the first component of comic making that that I was able to kind of become competent at first. Hmm. You know, I remember reading when when I was preparing to go to the Kubert School. I would read every interview with everybody I knew who went to the Kubert School because, like in the Marvel comics, you would see the ads and it would yeah. show the alumni, and it's like Steve Bissett, John Tottleben, Tim Truman, Andy, and Adam Kubert. So I would just, whenever I would see any of those names on the front cover of like a comics journal, which would happen with like Tim Truman and, and Bissett and them, or uh, Wizard Magazine, like I would just pour over those interviews. And I remember reading about uh, Adam and Andy becoming Cubert, uh, becoming professional letterers at age 12. And I was hmm. uh, like age 11 or 12 at the time. And I'm like, well, if these guys could do it, I could do it. And uh, I still have a lot of those pages where I would just take like a get get bond paper, you know, like the cheap kind of crappy drawn paper. It's like 11 by 14. Uh, the first thing you got to learn is just how to rule the lines with using the aims guide and how like you know you could do the first round but now you got to match up the pencil dot with the last line and then keep it going and keep it even so that's the first hurdle and then when i would have that fully lined up page just free association so so uh watching fresh prince of bel-air on tv or something and you know carlton banks you know just every word that would just kind of stream of conscious coming to mind and just practice day day in day out to try to get that to look right and and once once you can hand the letter and and put some actual like some good looking lettering on a comic uh, uh that in and of itself makes it look professional in a way like even if the drawing is kind of mm-hmm. trash i love i really admire good lettering um i think it's an incredibly it's an incredible skill that is essentially invisible when it's done well you don't notice it. You just can read and enjoy a page. Um, I'm curious. So I'm curious, you know, because I've lettered, but I only do it digitally. I don't have good enough penmanship to letter by hand. I just don't. You're saying that you do do like hand lettering. I'm curious what kind of tools you use. 
I just use microns. Yeah. Uh, the, my lettering teacher at uh, at the Cuber School would be very upset at, at, at that because they use those C nibs and the B nibs and stuff. Sure. Uh, I use that Pentel brush pen sometimes. Uh, all various really? width of um, it's actually not not microns. I've been using. I've been using those Copic fine liners. Yes. And I'm just looking around like I got my Ames guides kind of buried under. Oh, you do uh, have an Ames guide? Oh, oh, many yeah. Ames guides. This this is reference for one. <laughs> Why do you have that? <laughs> because like I have this. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's Sam Keith inspired for sure. But yeah, I have to draw this Fairfield. rotund fella in many different angles. So I'm just oh, like. Oh, that's clever. How do those titties look in a three quarter view? I did definitely notice that uh, he, your, your, your guy had some serious man boobs. I didn't realize that you had a 3D model for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very important. But uh, yeah, I got, I got a. I have a bunch of Ames guides for okay. very like point widths. And yeah, just, oh, here, it's here. fascinating. So like a uh, tip to everybody who's trying to hand letter, yep. like uh, when you arrive at your the point size that you like, put a little piece of tape on the wheel so that it never uh, slides and okay. you'll have the same uniform uh, letter lettering guides. Uh, yeah, just sort of lock that in. Yeah, we were uh, we got some feedback. Uh, when we're talking about lettering every now and then when people are like, I'm trying to learn the wheel, but it keeps sliding. So that's a little tip for you. I find hand lettering very hard. Like the, not the, not the ruling with the Ames guide, but like literally just coming up with consistent like A's and B's and C's. I just, it's just not something I feel I can do well by hand. Um, I feel like I can draw. I'm not a great artist, but I can draw, but I can't, I just can't do it. I, so, so I do all that digitally, which it's sort of a, a cheat, I suppose, but it's a lot no, faster. You, you just got to pick a good font. Uh, that's that's the only thing. Like yes. when, when we receive, we yes. we receive a lot of books at the at the PO box, and uh, there are incredible draftsmen uh, out there who, who are making these very beautifully drawn comics. And there's some kind of barrier in mind. Like they they dash out this lettering. And it really hurts the page in a major way. Uh, it 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 creates this un uniformity that that we immediately recognize as like kind of like amateurish. Mm. And I'm just like, oh, mm -hmm. I gotta school you can't like. It just doesn't have to be that way. Like you're you're so yeah. good. And if you just think about this one like little part, which you know, like you said, if it's done right, it's invisible and it's clear. But, but it's the part you read. It's kind it of one of the most important parts. It's, so every part is important. It, it, and, and you're 100% you're right. It's funny, you know, when I look back at the 50s EC comics that all used that Leroy lettering kit so that the lettering was just, it's almost like typing it essentially. It's what looks right because it's what I know. That said, personally, not a big fan of it. I don't think it has um, this sort of, uh, there's, there's a certain energy that does come with either a good font or a nice hand lettered uh, uh, writing style for, for lettering. Um, that's just me. I, I, I can't quite get into that Leroy locked in font. There was, there was a weird insecurity in comics for, for decades. And uh, you, you would see it, I think, did Jules Pfeiffer, uh, is he, is he a, an actor of this too? But certainly Harvey Kurtzman a lot. Uh, yeah. It through like later stage with Trump and, and Humbug and stuff where it's like typography means bourgeois or something like like yeah. oh, we're gonna we're gonna elevate our comics by having Times New Roman instead of hand lettering doesn't and look right it does it, it it's static it, it like it works in the new, in the New Yorker maybe um, yeah <laughs> maybe but uh, you know what another another uh, lettering tip uh, for for those at home using digital like when in doubt a good kind of um, basic font to use if you can't think of anything else is, is go buy the um, Astro Astro City font from I think if it's not Starking it's from Blambot or something. But uh, I can't remember which of the two either. But obviously both are good sites to get some fonts. Yeah. 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 I appreciate that advice. Hey, um, I'm just let, let's do something fun. What? creators these days like that are putting out books these days or or web comics or whatever like what excites you who out there excites you these days like inspires you to like just ah oh, i gotta put this down and pick up my pen now 
<laughs> uh, in, in manga, it's uh, Inio Asano's uh, comics have been uh, huge for me. Okay. Um, Not familiar. He's got a big body of work in town. Uh, this oh. is one of those things. I'm just, it's, uh, it's such a weird title. Dead Dead Demons, DDD -D Destruction. Excuse me. Have read the first issue of that. I found the art very interesting. Um, and, and, and I'll just like take a quick tangent, even though I asked you the question. Um, are you familiar with Naoki Urasawa's Monben show for NHK television in, in Japan? That's how, that's how I got associated with Inyo Asano's work, man. I was just going to say, like, that's a pretty interesting episode, seeing him do the very realistic recreation, essentially, of backgrounds. He's got a really interesting art style. So, yes, I am familiar. I just forgot the name. Yeah. Um, but but I took a tangent. I'm curious who else is, is exciting you and interesting you these days. J James Stokey, everything that he does uh, blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, Trad Moore's art is incredible. Michael DeForge, Simon Hanselman. Yep. I uh, I mean, there's there's a million people that's out great. there doing cool stuff. Yeah, that, that that's a, that's a pretty nice wide swath. I appreciate that, and I think that's part of why I like your show is that you guys also cover a little bit of everything: new, old, indie, uh, mainstream. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to think like foreign, domestic. Yeah, um, goofball oddity comics. So it, it begs the question, like, uh, how do you guys choose your topics? Because you're doing like a video a day. You cover so many comics and creators and stuff. Like, how are you choosing your topics? Because you choose, you, you cover so much. So, uh, you know, seven days a week, uh, the way the way it oscillates is uh, every week, one dude is going to get, have to edit you know, four, four videos, essentially. Um, we agree on our, our big video, the, the big conversation uh, that we usually put out on a, on a Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. This past week, it was the Galactus Trilogy because our homeboy Warren came to town and had the actual issues. Uh, I'm the guy that helps uh, uh, organize SPX, by the way. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do, you, do you know him personally from, from your time there? Something I've met like him that. a couple of times. Um, I don't know if he'd remember me, but yes, I've met him. Yes. Yeah, okay. He, he, Warren's interesting. He definitely knows a lot about Silver Age, about as much as anybody out there today knows about like, you know, older comics and stuff. So great guy that I'm glad you guys did that episode. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. And, and we have a week, a week worth of stuff that we did with him, but, um, we, you know, we agree on the big Sunday video. I'm sitting here in a, uh, a studio, um, you know, three of 300 comics fit in a long box, like multiply that times 80. Like that's how you many have 80 long boxes, Ed? Probably more because there's a lot of half ones and, and, and shit like that, man. It just, real estate is cheap here in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh, uh, which means that the stores can also have big space and have a lot of back issues and for very cheap. So I, it seems I had 30 long boxes and like seven years ago, I moved across the country and I pretty much sold it all. I kept like about one to two long boxes of the stuff that's sentimental to me, but I just sold it all. And I thought that 30 was a lot to manage. You, you, you're, you're never going to move. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. Man. Like the, the landlord here at, at, at the studio is a cool cat. He's like, I will never uh, up, up charge your rent. And as long as I own this place and, and whenever he's ready to sell, I'll just buy it and just use this joint as a, as a warehouse. Uh, That's so cool. Know, as my, as my studio or whatever, just, just let it continue to grow and grow and grow. But, but I, I didn't say that as in like a braggadocio way. No, I understand. I, I just didn't it, know you had so many. Yeah. I said it in a way of like, you know, we, we each just pick three other books, you know, like yeah. every, every week. And, and we try, we try to, um, Mix it up a little bit. Obviously, you want to try to, you know, you see that back end uh, of, of in YouTube and of your, you know, your past 10 videos. Like, where it's, does this video stack up? Uh, it's a video game to me. I, I want to try to have number ones as much as possible. Right. But, but uh, maybe I don't want to talk about Spawn every week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it, yeah. you know as well as I do that uh, a lot of people, you know, probably the bulk of uh, the audience they, they want to be entertained more than educated. 
in a lot no. of ways. Like, th like uh, they, they want to hear you talk about the stuff they already know about. Um, I think that that's very true to a large degree. You have to sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, you have to vary it up with both what people sort of want, stuff that they know and go and can agree on. And then you sort of slide in a couple of things that you're like, so if you like all that, you're probably going to like this too. You, you know, you got to have your vegetables with your, uh, with your meat. You do it so well too, man. Like your, your channel is definitely a big inspiration, but I have these piles on this table and I just, I just will peel them off. You know, like I went uh, over this weekend, I was pr procrastinating a little bit. Yeah. Just, let's see what you got. Just, some of it. Just I'm just curious. Books. You don't have to show us all of it, but yeah, sure. So like Mignola Alpha Flight. Okay. This one's real cool, man. Paul Kupperberg uh, completely oh, cool. does this. So he, he colors it, letters it, writes it. Uh, it's the only other Marvel book um, that was done by a single person. Um, Alex Toth, inked by Terry Austin, uh, Superman Annual. We'll cover that what one. What a treat. Super early Brian Stelfreeze comic, Psychops. Don't know that one, but I love Stelfreeze. You know how it goes, man. Like like when we when we dig up uh, an early effort, like that has to get the treatment. Um, this is great. Yeah. Bucky O'Hare, you know, first appearance, man. Echo of- Ah, uh, like, amazing, yeah. amazing. And then there's other stuff too, like uh, an old Fantagraphics catalog. Like, I think that would make a good episode. Definitely, yeah. Sort of remember some of the stuff that might've gotten forgotten. And I see Solo right there, which was just an amazing title, one of DC's best. Yeah, yeah. Shouts to Mark Chiarello. Like, there's this kind of through line that happens, almost a narrative with the, the YouTube channel where stuff gets on our radar or we read an interview where Gil Kane says something fascinating that really mm. makes us think a lot. And then we start to make choices for future videos with some of those thoughts in mind. Um, you know, Gil Kane in this, in this one conversation with, uh, with Robert Crumb in Comics Journal, he was talking about like the hyperbole of Kirby's style and how how um, bombastic it became and how Kirby had to like, he, his, his style of comics, like the, the stakes became too high for like bandits and bank robbers and stuff like it was just too, too wild. Um, right. So he had to create gods and things. I'm, I'm thinking right. about like the antithesis of that would be like if you ever saw um, the Bern Hogarth Tarzan Sundays where he's yeah. drawn kind of twisted up crazy characters but he can't ever draw like there will be panels with a dude on the phone but the guy on the phone's talking like in yeah. and shit and uh, it, uh, I, I feel bad like uh, obviously Bert Hogarth is very respected uh, for some reason his worth just leaves me a little cold because it always feels like it's an academic exercise as compared to just like a natural storytelling like panel or something yeah if that sure. makes sense maybe that's mean I don't know <laughs> there, there was, you know, <laughs> that that generation. There were those guys who helped kind of push down some door, some some boundaries, man, and and, and open yeah. things up to the wider world. Yeah. But their 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 sensibilities were rooted in pulp. Yeah. And they they themselves could only take it so far. It's like they introduced the idea that the next generation was going to be able to um, exploit and and. Um, evolve the medium further and Bert mm -hmm. Hogarth is one of those cats that like sure you know he was very hyperbolic there's I've, I've heard the say I've heard like a ratio mon version of this this uh story from like five six people involved that but that the difference being that they all told the same story uh, about being on a on a panel with uh with Bert Hogarth and it's like Dan Klaus and the Hernandez brothers Robert Crumb and maybe Gary Groth was a moderator or something like that. And Bern Hogarth is just like waxing all of this sort of pretend, like when you get down to the work, like sort of pretentious in the, you know, the Merriam Webster dictionary definition of the word, when you see the work that he makes with what he is coming out of his mouth. And, uh, you know, the Fantagraphics dudes are just like yawning. And I think Robert Crumb just to break the monotony just kicks the chair back and falls on his ass just to just to be a jerk and uh you know, it's, that's sort of the deal it's like on stage are the people who have taken a little bit of what um that previous generation kind of like uh instituted or whatever or or um some ideas that they that they brought into the initial conversation 
question. And, uh, you know, they're the, they're the generation that takes it further than, you know, the, the OGs. Eisen, Eisner's in that camp. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kurtzman did good work though. Oh yeah. Like, like he, like his, his stuff, um, for, for what he was trying to do, like, like his, his stuff was really evolved in, in real, real good comic book making. Absolutely. The stuff he was doing for mad was impressive too, but uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so what's, what, what's left that you really would um, like to accomplish in comics? Are there, are there certain stories you want to tell? Are there certain, like, what, what, what would um, make you feel fulfilled? What make, what, 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 what makes you feel good about comics? Uh, it's the process that, that makes me f- the process okay the journey just just sitting at the page grinding like you you pop into our live streams whenever i'm working on a page and and that is that is what i'm in it for that's my zen state sit there Mm -hmm. in lotus position hanging out uh just just work working on my comics like that's everything by the time the book comes out right completely out of my hands uh it's and it's it's my past like it's Hmm. It's uh, far in my past, in a, in a way. That first issue of Red Room was drawn a year ago, be more than a year ago. So I'm not even thinking about that uh, in in terms of like the quality or anything like that. It that is for you. That's for everybody else. But the process, like I just um, have created a situation where where I'm gonna I should be able to just continue living life the way I sort of want, wanted to always live it. Man, have good be surrounded by good people you Uh, deserve it ed you deserve it like you you, you're you're definitely um hard worker and i and i think that like uh that's actually something i'm studying for the current episode i'm putting together is that like uh to be a cartoonist to be a comic book creator you really need to have stamina somehow you really need to like enjoy it uh for yourself before any of the audience and and have that stamina it's really impressive what you what you've already accomplished and what you continue to accomplish every day i think uh it's it it comes down to um you you are 100 percent right and there are tools that one can have to 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 achieve that stamina in such as a pleasing way so you have to reward yourself for good behavior in a way man um okay. you, get, you get that page done that is an accomplishment you know, like when you put the last little drop of ink down on that page and that one's done, take a step back, go for a walk, go move your bones, go be with good people. You've, you've earned a little time uh, to, to kind of like live your life and uh, rejoice in that victory, get used to the feeling of that accomplishment. And, uh, you know, your brain just rewards that, that good behavior. Now go do another page wash rinse repeat man maybe go play some super mario 3 uh go go see a movie um that's to me that's that's it's, it's like small chunk in it you know mm-hmm. like uh, not it's not like the cartoon thing you don't you never want to be in that position where it's like this is the to do pile and i'm on page one right all right now i'm on page two like you never want that you never don't think about that okay it's one page at a time one page at a time get that done enjoy life a little bit, get back to the hustle. It, it, I think, I think it is a little extra, um, weird for, for people who, um, work in the same place they live. Uh, you know, like, w- like, when do you turn it off? Um, yeah. yeah also, absolutely. also, uh, you gotta have that discipline to, to do the work. Like whenever, whenever I quit working at that, that call center, when I was, when I was a kid, I think like maybe a month and a half really flew by pretty fast when I didn't have that work routine. I was getting caught up in, hey man, I could do anything I want whenever I want. Like I could go hang out with the homies. I could go r- ride bicycles, go go paint graffiti. And then it's like, oh, a month and a half flew by really, really quickly. But even before that, the two years I worked at that call center flew by even faster, blink of an eye. So it's mm-hmm. like, you gotta, you gotta make the most of your day and nobody's telling you to do anything. So it's, it's on you. And uh, one of the ways that you could do that is just by building in little treats when you hit your little goals. I like that. I like that. That's a really positive way of looking at things. Let's close it out with like just one last question. Tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of like a typical 
day for you? Like, what do you, when do you start? What are you looking to accomplish? Like, what kind of things do you actually do in that day? And when do you call it quits? <laughs> the calling it quits, that's the tough part. So I've, I've become more of a day walker since, uh, since 2020 went down. And, you know, Jimmy and I, one, one day a week, like we basically get together at about 6 a.m. and uh, do our a whole week's worth of videos um, in order to, to like not be a zombie then. I've been actually going to sleep at like midnight or 1, 1 a.m., which is, which is unheard of for me. Um, I get up probably 5, 6 a.m., get the heck outside immediately, uh, sometimes before breakfast, and do 20 miles on the bike. Wow. To, like get some fresh air, um, move the bones, man. Like just, just use it or lose it. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Body and, fuels the mind or, or yeah. And, and when I'm, when I'm out on, on the trails and stuff, I think about what I have to do that day in terms for creatively. So I'm letting that next page swirl around in my head to try to think of the best way to compose it, to write it, dialogue stuff. Uh, where I'm at right now is I'm roughing out uh, my my next issue. So I have a specific deadline. I, I want I want that done, and roughing it out also means writing it. And I'm kind of doing a little bit Marvel method. So it's like I got to get at least one page of that done at the very 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 bare minimum. Uh, yeah. Better if I get you know page and a half, two pages, man. And basically, I just grind until until I, I hit hit that goal when it's time to actually put pencil to paper on the actual comic page. Uh, when, when I get started, I, 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 I don't stop till it's done, you know? So if I, if I, if I want to get sleep, uh, if I want to get plenty of sleep that night, better not play on Instagram, better not be tweeting. There, that, that's, that's an amazing amount of discipline. Not everybody has that. Um, but uh, it's really, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Ed. Chris, can um, I ask you a question? You you may. Normally, I do not allow any questions. I am the host. No, go ahead and ask me a question. Well, you know, I mean, we really look up to the channel. Like we we've we've seen your grind, how you've grown, and stuff like that. And and like any advice you would have for us uh, for cartoonist Kayfabe would 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 be incredible. And uh, certainly, mm-hmm. you don't you don't put out uh, a video every day or whatever. So so you're putting a lot of thought into these things. I'm I'm just right. curious about that part of the process. Yeah, well, that, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, uh, first of all, I think the best thing anyone can do for a YouTube channel is be consistent. That doesn't have to be like daily or hourly or, or anything. Like, you know, ideally it's weekly. This year, this past like sort of year has been tough for me and I've only been able to do closer to like one every two weeks just because I'm just so busy and stuff. But as long as you're fairly consistent, the audience needs that. They want to be reminded. They want to be able to count on you. Um, and, and you guys definitely have that. Um, the other thing is that you have to know that like YouTube works off of an algorithm that also constantly changes and it's good to read up on sort of what that is every once in a while. Uh, so if your last four videos got less views than the fifth and sixth video back, they're not going to promote you as much. And that just means you have to, you know, maybe be ready for that so that you can promote yourself a little extra through various social media channels. Sometimes YouTube will promote you a lot if you just like have the right thumbnail and title. And it's sort of a game. It's uh, You were saying earlier, you know, it's a game you want to win. Um, it's a little unfair, to be honest, sometimes, because, uh, you know, you're trying, you're, you're making good content that you like doesn't always connect with the audience. Um, one thing I, I sort of did that initially when I was growing helped my channel and then it became, it started to hurt my channel. Every October, I would do that Inktober thing. I would live stream every single day of October. And the first two years where my channel was growing, it helped because it brought new eyeballs to the show. Then I got to a certain point where, you know, we'll just say that like my average video gets like 40,000 views in a week or something. Then I do a live stream and it gets maybe 2,000 views. All of a sudden, YouTube is saying, oh, people don't like his videos as much. And like all of a sudden, the growth of my channel slowed way, way, way down. Frustrating. 
just something you have to sort of keep in mind, you know, is your goal to put out the content that you want, or is it to play the YouTube game and try to get more subscribers and make money? Um, it's probably a balance, uh, realistically. But yeah, so those are some of the things you just got to keep in mind is that YouTube is a machine, and it can be a little capricious. Dude, that's super helpful. Because that, say, ex that explains like, a I lot. Think you guys, like the topics you do, and the format that you have is fantastic. It's unique. Nobody else is doing what you guys do. You're getting two different professionals to comment in real time in a very friendly way that like feels like you're almost in the room with somebody. You get to hear their thoughts on a comic. I, I think that like the, the game you could play with YouTube, put the fact that you guys each have amazing graphic design skills and like try to think of like a, thumbnails that like maybe catch the audience's eyes even more because it's just like one simple very simple image and, and many times you do don't get me wrong i'm not like criticizing you i'm just saying that like that in the title can count for a lot a lot yeah for sure like i totally get that part man and, and it's it's that thing where we we're so shy about a lot of things like we have we have great clickbait titles for every video, but it's just yeah, like, you just do. can't do it. It just can't, like, like sometimes we can't. Can. You, you, you should do more, you should do more. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think this is something that like I, and I'm not saying that I do it very well. Um, there's other people that I think like, you know, within YouTube that have really good thumbnails. Um, there's a guy, Matt Draper, that does really good ones. Um, if you have like something very consistent, you know, like a consistent font or even a consistent color choice, a consistent color palette so that like, you know, for instance, if there was a, a pink box with like text on it on the left hand side of the, the, the thing every single time people would go, I know who that is. Word. As compared to it's just like a comic uh, image, they might just go like, is that the one that I watch every week or is that somebody else that I don't watch? Smart. Super smart. Anyway, <laughs> you know, just Chris random thoughts. This 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 whole this whole game comics game. this YouTube stuff all of it, uh, it's it's all just intuition. It, like we have no idea. So getting any schooling, man, big help. Look, you guys put out like consistent good content. Uh, that's a big part of why I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. I appreciate that you've been so generous with your time. Um, I hope that people. Check out Red Room. It's worth noting that this is really the time if you're seeing this, you know, in April. If you want to read it, this is when you go to your comic book store and say, hey, open up previews, go to the Fantagraphic section, order me Red Room, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. I, you know, we're recording this 4-13 uh, on, on uh, the 20th of April. It's going to be uh, all, all, all bets are off, man. Like the final orders have to be in. We have to hit that print button, make the comic books happen then. And uh, up to this point, everything I've done sells out instantly when it comes to, you know, the, the first issue or the first volume of something. So like, uh, hopefully we mitigated that a little bit. Jim Rugg, Peach Momoko, they did these variant covers that are go goosing the numbers up, man. So hopefully wow. there's be a couple more copies on the shelves for people to kind of just wander in and, and find uh, the comic. But uh you can't take for granted that something so weird is going to be on the shelf without you know asking your store certainly in these crazy times now with how diamond is 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 working and and you know new distribution in the game all new of that distribution stuff. models it's uh it's a, it's a weird time and i'm sure you know people going into store traffic is is lower than it was you know pre covid and stuff so you just can't assume that your comic retailer uh, has all the margins in the world to be taking a, a shot on, a, you know, fresh new comic. So just tell tell your uh, shop to uh, yeah. to carry the thing if if you want to check it out and if you like it, get to put on your pull list every week, uh, every you month, man. Every month, right? Because because you're doing at least thirteen issues. Um, and I uh, I'll, I'll back that up. I love the comic book stores that I go to. They do a very good job of ordering a bit of everything. But by default, they're not going to be ordering stuff from Fantagraphics or Oni and stuff, at least not in big numbers. But if I tell them, of course they will. That's money in their pocket. So um, it's very easy to, to do that. Anything else you would like to plug right now? 
No, just, you know, do the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel every uh, every uh, day. And uh, if you want to read the comics ahead of time, you can hit my Patreon. I have three full issues up there right now. I'll put new new strips up every Tuesday, and it's three bucks for the whole archive. That's, I mean, what kind of a value is that, folks? Like $3, and you could read three issues right now. That's, that's a pretty good value. Uh, I don't think anyone else in comics can come close to that except free comic book day. Um, one thing I'll plug for you, you guys have a like fan-made cartoonist kayfabe Facebook page. It's very, very active. You have some incredible viewers and a lot of them have been creating fan art for Red Room in the last couple of weeks. And some of it is very exciting. So I, I will say it does not talk exclusively about cartoonist kayfabe. You've got a very active group there that talks about all sorts of comic stuff. I, I definitely recommend that. It's a fun group. Yeah, cool. I, I actually, I I keep objective, like I'm, I'm not a part of that. Like I don't see it or anything like that just it's because I don't want to be influenced by, by strangers. Uh, but cool to know, and I've certainly have been getting a lot of that uh, fan art because I, in the back of the issues, I want to have what I call the gore gallery. And uh, <laughs> awesome. I, I'm going to print a bunch of that stuff. I got about five, six dozen pieces to to, to wade through. Some things I want to talk to Fanta about uh, regarding that, maybe get a couple extra pages each issue to, 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 to highlight some stuff because it's like extremely professional, beautiful yeah. artwork, I'm man. Some great artwork. Yeah, it's it's insane. And I, I was thinking like it would just, it would be cool to have some weird fan art like in the back of Spawn, the way they used to do that, where it was oh, like- I love kind that. Of, yeah, but it's usually pretty rough and and- you know it was but that was like the fun and they did it in wizard too like that like that's a big part of what we sort of um i mean i'm older than you but we still like grew up getting to see some of that fan art in wizard and spawn um kirkman definitely did, does it in a lot of his books sometimes eric larson might but not everybody does it's really cool to see good fan art yeah we're putting a call out in that first issue too because like i, I got a piece in there from from philip tan is like wow. a, the fan art but there's a the first red room tattoo is in there and it's on Ooh. a girl's thigh and it's real giant like it's huge it's a big commitment which that's uh amazing that's got to be flattering when somebody is willing to permanently commit your idea to their body oh it's totally wild man uh, so wow. i you know i'm there i'm like yeah man promoting more red room tattoos and then the first cosplay started coming in man this dude made a poker face cost like mask and that's one of the things that when conventions start up again i want to start seeing my red room guys menacing the uh the 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 comic festival grounds man just walking around looking all, all gnarly and scary you've got some very iconic designs in red room i will say that so yeah cosplay could be very exciting stuff yeah super fun chris awesome. thanks for having me dude it's been a pleasure ed thank you so much for your time continued success to you okay People have been clamoring for us to connect in some way. <laughs> Boom, here it is. It did it. I hope it lived up to their expectations. <laughs> Take Thanks, care. Chris. Yep.